The book of Judges is full of underdog leaders. In fact, each of the six major judges has something unique to their backgrounds that would have earned them the label underdog by their societies. Othniel is a younger brother where privileges usually went to firstborns. Gideon is described as being the least of his family from the weakest clan. Jephthah was the son of a prostitute. Samson, the son of a barren woman, at a time where barrenness was considered sinful. Ehud was left-handed, and Deborah, of course, was a woman. During this period of Israelite history, which occurred between the conquest of Canaan and King Saul's monarchy, a judge served the role as a spiritual and military leader who was appointed by God to settle disputes within and among the tribes and to bring people to faith. The story of Deborah is found in chapters 4 and 5 of that book. She is labeled a prophet, an oracle, meaning she had direct communication with God. We first meet Deborah in chapter 4, where she summons her army commander Barak, or Barak, and tells him that God commands him to mount a sneak attack against the Canaanite army, led by General Sisera, using 10,000 men borrowed from two other tribes. At the time of this order, the Canaanites had been oppressing Israel for 20 years, so Barak is initially reluctant to heed Deborah's orders, but gives in as long as she accompanies him. Now, this wasn't an unusual request by Barak, for it was quite typical to have a holy person present during a military setting. But due to his reluctance, Deborah tells him that the road on which he is going will not lead to his glory, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Now, although Israel does not have any iron weaponry at this point in their history, per God's plan, the Israelite sneak attack actually works, and Sisera's troops alongside his 900 chariots are thrown into a panic. Sensing defeat, General Sisera flees the scene. Running in scared, General Sisera seeks out an old friend, Aber the Kinite, who used to have ties with Israel, but had since defected to become a military and political ally of the Canaanites. Sisera reaches his friend's tent and discovers Aber's wife, Jael, there alone. She convinces him that he's in safe hands and gets him to come inside the tent and covers him with a blanket to rest. He requests water, but she provides him with milk. While Sisera sleeps, Jael picks up a tent peg and hammers it into his head. Alas, Israel is victorious. This is a story of two women carrying the action of the narrative. Given the cultural gender roles of this period, Deborah and Jael do man better than the men themselves. Here, the warrior men, Barak and Sisera, are surprisingly passive figures. Against Deborah, Barak comes across as reluctant, arguably cowardly, and is accordingly deprived of expected honor and glory. Deborah, on the other hand, is nothing but initiative and boldness. JL likewise embarks on a flurry of activity that results in the death of Sisera, who is also largely passive. He makes no direct reply, but simply follows her silently into the tent. He accepts the drink of milk, even though he asks for water, and allows himself to be covered. JL's gender nonconformity reaches its peak when she hammers the tent peg into Sisera's head. In other words, she forcibly penetrates him. Many biblical scholars have commented on the erotic subtext of the story. JL poses as Sisera's savior and seductress, tucking him in a bed and providing him with a glass of milk. Milk, of course, calls to mind the imagery of breast. And the phrase, she comes to him quietly, parallels the seduction of Ruth to Boaz, right before the former uncovers the latter's feet. Feet, in the Hebrew scriptures, is sometimes a euphemism for genitals. JL's feet are explicitly mentioned a chapter later in Deborah's song as she describes Sisera's death in 527. He sank, he fell, he lay still at her feet. At her feet he sank, he fell. Where he sank, there he fell dead. Is he at her feet or between her legs? Oh, and then there's that tent peg, an obvious phallic image that is penetrated into Sisera's temple, or in some translations, his mouth. 
chapter 4 begins with gender role reversal. A woman rather than a man is judging Israel. By the end of that same chapter, patriarchal expectation is turned upside down as the warrior's mouth is penetrated by an unmistakably phallic tent peg. In the next chapter, the author of Judges powerfully intersperses the scene of Sisera's death at the hands of a woman with a glimpse of another female figure, the hero's mother, who anxiously awaits her son's victorious return from battle. In contrast to Jael, the tent-dwelling woman, the mother of Sisera is an aristocrat peering from a house with latticework windows, accompanied by ladies-in-waiting. They assure her that her son is late only because he and his men are busy dividing up the spoil. Among the spoil are typically women. But the reader knows what his mother does not, that no Israelite women are to be raped. But rather, it was Sisera himself who had been pillaged by the hand of a woman. Needless to say, queer theologians adore the characters of Deborah and J.L. for their gender nonconforming narratives. And although there has been some fan fiction written about these two, there's really no scriptural evidence to suggest that Deborah and J.L. had ever met. Judges 4 is one where the powerful, the male, shows weakness, and the weak, the female, shows strength. This picture makes for an apt paradigm for weak Israel, which in the book of Judges time and time again defeats a more powerful enemy. And that's likely what the author was going for in this story, as this is also a theme throughout the entirety of the Bible. God is predictably unpredictable. <laughs> I love that this message of truth is taught using genderqueer figures and that God's people are made victorious through gender nonconformity. This is a message that I'm sure will resonate throughout the rest of the Bible, considering Deborah told Barak that the victory would not be his own, but attributed to a woman. So let's just see for ourselves. In Paul's letter to the Hebrews, the epistle writer provides a litany of Israelite all-stars in chapter 11. We got Abraham. Moses, Rahab the prostitute, Gideon, Barak, oh, f 